good evening, my dear friends. Uh, we have here with us Mr. Parthiv Shah. Uh, he is a very young and dynamic expert on stock markets, and he is a director in Tricom Stockbroking. So, uh, just a brief introduction before he starts his session. Before uh, you know, going to him, I would like to, his father is a veteran in stock markets, uh, Sri Vijay Shah, and I had the good fortune to start my career and learn equity research from him. So you can understand with certain expert at home, uh, you know, he's no doubt become an equity master himself. And also he has done a lot of hard work and it's his passion, so he's maybe moved ahead of his father also now. So uh, quickly, just to give his basic background, he has done a BA in electronics and communications from Dharam Singh Desai University at Nadiyad. Then he did his MS in telecommunications management from University of Maryland in US, and then back in India and into stock broking. Uh, he has now more than a decade's experience. They have both NSE and BSC corporate membership. Uh, being, you know, MS technology and all you, as you saw, they use the latest technology platforms and they have over 10,000 satisfied customers. And as he says, their motto is, your wealth creation is our satisfaction. Uh, he regularly appears, I don't know, many of you might have seen, he's there on CNBC English, Hindi and Gujarati and in ET Now Sandesh. And uh, he is a guest lecturer also at Nirma University and at uh, Ahmedabad University. And as he says, uh, he likes to share his experiences and learnings from stock markets, but he also likes to share his mistakes also. So from hopefully from which all of us also can benefit. And the topic is sector opportunities, vision 2030 Indian stock market. Uh, before I hand it over to him, uh, one small thing I have to just small introduction about uh, Ahmedabad Management Association, all of you know, uh, so I don't have to say much. But apart from all the activities that we do, we have multiple programs and activities happening here like management development training program, uh, export import programs. And there is a special six months postgraduate program, which is in affiliation with uh, California State University uh, called San Bernardino. And it includes different types of management programs. So as EMA Ahmedabad Management Association, it is also well known as EMA always moving ahead. So on behalf of Ahmedabad Management Association, I would like to welcome Parthibai and give him a small memento from behalf of EMA. So uh, we'll have Parthiv take over. Uh, one small request, all of you, kindly put your mobiles on silent mode. Please do not disturb in the middle of the speech. We'll have uh, just quickly question answer session will be at the end. So keep your questions ready and we will take them up at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Narayan Bhai, uh, AMA committee members. And uh, thanks a lot to NSC for always encouraging me for such events and giving me this uh, esteemed opportunity to be in front of uh, this August gathering. Uh, what I realize is that uh, Nifty is at, uh, not at 18,800, it's at 17,600, 800 zones. So I see the crowd depleting, which is good, uh, a real indicator that you got to be bullish now, right? So you all are the privileged ones, so happy to have you all. And uh, a lot of you all who are already present for the first session, this is basically part two. Uh, so just to give you all a brief, uh, the first session was all about, you know, where India's stock market is headed and what sort of wealth creation you all can expect from India right up to 2030. And we had given a lot of data points and a lot of rational as to why there is a huge conviction irrespective of what happens in the short to medium term. But until 2030, you all are, all are going to make fantastic money if you all are having conviction and stay invested in the Indian stock markets. So my friends at NSE, you know, they suggested 
that lot of y'all are interested not only know the data points and y'all all know that you know till 2030 huge amount of net worth is going to create it from the stock market but where are the opportunities in which sectors will the opportunities lie so that is why we are here and generally this is part 2 generally in the bollywood movies the part 2s you know are not very hit but i hope with the sector opportunities that i'm going to throw here a lot of you all are going to take a lot in terms of your investment decisions so general disclaimer whatever we are discussing here is mainly for education uh, please don't take anything as an advice as an investment advice you all have your own financial advisors feel free to consult them for any investment decisions you all take this is purely for uh, education purpose and i am not affiliated with any of the political parties so anything i talk regarding the reforms is not reflective of you know my bias towards any one so if you see overall india did relatively well so i just want to throw some uh, you know market outlook perspective as well before i start with the sectors what happened was that you know uh, last year was very tricky because you saw the us markets you know going down by 22% you saw the korean markets going down by 22% uh, the nasdaq you know one of the favorites i have so many friends in us you know all from technology and i was also in us i came back for good in 2010 and i did my ms in telecommunications over there a lot of my friends from intel cisco's of the world junipers of the world they were all bragging until the last couple of years post covid that you know their it portfolio is doing fantastically well uh, sitting on multi bagger returns a lot of you all would have relatives or kids in us and right now if you talk to them unfortunately with the retail mindset none of them are able to exit and today a lot of the portfolios are bleeding and very surprisingly at that juncture you know the indian markets were just recovering we were doing well but we were recovering and we were not running at that pace the way the us markets were running at and you see last year very surprisingly the indian markets despite a historical high fpi selling foreigner selling we were extremely resilient i would not use the word as strong i would use the word as resilient because you see from this chart that we were at 4.5% or a 4% nifty gains even if you talk of the mid cap indices because generally you seen a trend when nifty would be up but you know in a heavy selling environment or in an environment where we are just recovering and lot of corporate data that was presented we got to know that you know despite the fact that lot of them did well in terms of top line growth but the margin shrunk and i'm going to talk about it you know the inflationary trends despite all of that you know india did well and we'll see the reason why but you see on the whole most of the big countries whether it's the eurozone it was down by 11% us i talked about uh, the chinese market also didn't do well and even in india if i have to give a break up as to which sectors led the most boring and the most hated sector which is the public sector banks you know they did fantastically well nobody had anticipated because they did well after a lull period of almost 9 to 10 years huge capital erosion in those banks and after all of that you saw that that was a leading sector followed by the nifty bank indices which did 19% which is stupendous in such an environment you know so the most hated sectors and which sector did not do well again the favorite sector of previous year which is it so it was overbought valuations had gone through the roof and the way the us markets and the data points from the us came you know there was a huge slowdown i would not say slowdown in terms of the earnings but slowdown in terms of the valuation re-rating rather there was a de-rating in the it sector and right now the uh, earnings and in terms of the projections the indian it sector is sitting at reasonably fair valuations so this is a different break up if you see a very interesting thing has happened so i am in the stock market since the last almost 15 years and in my 15 years rarely i have seen a phenomena where in a rising interest rate environment and see generally whenever there is a rising interest rate environment it is generally a global phenomena i have rarely seen that in terms of the multiples of you know rising the global markets you know the us and the europe generally are very meager in terms of the rise but this time if you see the us the australian market and as compared to canada australia us indian interest rates have gone up but not to the level that it used to otherwise you see australia has gone up from 0.10% to 3.10% it's a huge jump uh, canada has gone from 0.25% to 4.25% it's a huge jump 
uh, United States from 0.13% to 3.88% and vis a vis India from 4 to 6.25% and still the US Fed is talking of that in 2023 the trend of rates might still be further up. This is something very good because generally why this is important we have to always track the inflation uh, interest rates and the inflation differential between the two countries and this goes to show that in India thanks to the fact that we have a very good savings you know ideology see what happened in US even in my last lecture I talked about in the US there was a data point I shared 50% of the employed people were on paycheck to paycheck so what happens when there's a three or six month covid breakdown and people are not giving salaries people will come on streets so that's why there was unprecedented printing of money in the US markets as a result of which they had to give that $1200 check so that those people could survive for three to four months but in India I remember a lot of jokes were floating around that apna stimulus was more like Baba Ji Ka Thullu it's just in talk nothing in action no money gave and trust me that was probably one of the best decisions that our government in coordination with RBI took because India cannot afford a hyperinflationary scenario and there's a reason why if you see current inflationary trends India is lot more resilient and that is also another reason because the stability of our macro was pretty strong our stock markets despite the high valuations as compared to even the other comparable peers in the emerging market basket we did extremely well so again this is the unfortunate part and generally if you must have heard the consensus commentary that as compared to 2021 the nice rise that we saw in our stock markets and also in 2022 the stability probably 2023 could not be as good trust me my predictions are most horrible when it comes to the stock market indices predicting for one year you can ask me for five years ten years relatively it's easy to predict and I'll give you the secret why it is easy to predict if you see the stock market returns over the last 10 years it has mimicked the growth of your nominal GDP plus dividend growth if you see your nominal GDP growth it stands at around 11.5 percent over the last 10 15 20 years and you see the stock markets also doing that but if you tell me what is going to be the nominal GDP growth next year twice in this year it has been downgraded right so has been the case with the global growth forecast if you see the global growth forecast India which was sitting at a prediction of 6.9 percent within a matter of seven eight months the prediction is 6.1 percent uh, Philippines uh, China Indonesia it's not only India it's the entire global growth that has been downgraded but still India sitting at 6.1 percent real growth <coughs> with a 5 to 6 percent inflation we are talking about a nominal GDP growth of 11 to 12 percent which is pretty healthy in the current scheme of things this is the best part for India and before even I talk about the different sectors that we are talking of it's so important that India which currently is a net importer a lot of these commodities this has come down please don't forget the fact that in 2022 not only the money printing which created an inflationary trend and sudden pent up demand and lack of supply chain from China and we all know what games China tends to play you know they they kept this covid policy zero tolerance policy and they control the world supply chain so they were one of the major creators of inflation for the US and for the West and even for India because India also imports a lot of stuff from China added to that thanks to the Ukraine war Russia Ukraine war a lot of other key commodity and other supply chain was disrupted so all of that added to the inflationary pressures but the good thing is as markets likes to digest a lot of things so has the commodity markets they know the war is there they know it's going to be for the long haul but then all of that is discounted so if you see the commodities luckily for us the Brent crude has corrected by almost 22 percent the steel prices have gone down and this is very important because steel was one of the best performing sectors last to last year and then <coughs> the Indian government had to intervene and put you know the export uh, duty cuts uh, increase and all that so now luckily you know the prices have cooled off which is very important for our infra growth you see aluminum prices uh, you see the Baltic dry index one of the major commentaries coming from a lot of corporates last year was the shipping freights have gone through the roof 
and that's one of the major reasons why their margins are getting downgraded. Even a lot of cement companies out here were complaining about high freight cost, right? So if you see, a lot of things have corrected and even something like cotton, I was talking to some of the textile companies, they said it was an unprecedented year, you know, from 50,000 to 1 lakh, you know, how do we manage our inventory? We had inventory losses, how do we manage, you know, our customers' expectations? So it was a very challenging environment, but all of this boards very well and sets a very good base for us to take care of our next leg of growth. So if you see the summary, global inflationary pressures surprised on the upside because a lot of factors that I just talked of. There was this geopolitical shocks added fuel to the fire. Uh, steepest and widespread global rate hike cycle. See, I mean, uh, that is the best thing to do when there is inflationary trend so high. Even US, you know, I talked to a lot of my relatives in US. Never ever they have seen such high price rises. The last they saw was in 1970s. So imagine those Western guys, they had this unprecedented boom of raising money at almost 0 to 1% interest rate. And now when you talk of the interest rates over there, they almost touch 5%, right? So things have changed. Impact on global growth is definitely there. And trust me, when we talk of India shining, India rising, it needs to be in tandem with the global growth being steady. You cannot have India growing at an unprecedented level, segregated from the world. We are in a connected world environment. And when you hear of global level growth be growing, and India growing at a different level is not going to be possible. We are all coupled, right? And there are a lot of export targets that I'm going to talk of, but that will happen only if the world stabilizes. So India is again not immune to a lot of these uh, and a lot of macro parameters. And India growth impulse has emerged after years of slowdown. A lot of things have happened. I'll talk about the ingredients and things that have happened, which will help us to build further conviction in a lot of sectors that we talk of. So if you see India's inflation rate, excellent. Trust me, I think the coordination that RBI has done along with the government and even the government ensuring that the supply side is well maintained and not printing money, increasing the money supply at an unprecedented level turned out to be so good for us that today I think India in terms of its micros of inflation trend is looking better and RBI is projecting that by this year end, you know, our inflation will look in the range that they want, you know, the targeted range is 4 to 6 percent. So I think if that happens, it's going to be fantastic. Tax collections have been fantastic and see this is real data. When we talk of GST, you know, a lot of people will argue that, you know, if you see because of inflation, in value terms, the prices of goods had gone up. So that's why relatively your GST has gone up. But my argument is, despite the value of prices going up, consumers have bought, right? That's real demand. And then only your GST has gone up. So if you see your GST growth, it has been fantastic in double digits, you know. So this is a very important lead indicator to show that the base of our economy is strong and still further growing. So now the GST base has become 1 lakh 46,000 crores, you know, in terms of the monthly run rate. Very important high frequency data, which again indicates economic stability. See, I am not here to talk about the outlook only for 2023. We are talking about right till 2030. But it's very important to know these parameters that despite all these parameters, if at all, you were to get a fantastic opportunity in the market to invest because our valuations, when I talk of our valuations, we are one of the highest in the world because our return on equity is also very high. Even in the emerging market basket, we are quoting at almost a hundred percent premium in terms of valuation. So if we were to correct, I think it's a very healthy sign. You know, you'll have a lot more money coming into the stock markets. You see, I talked about the GST collections, the EVA bill numbers at 13.3 percent compounded. And trust me, this is the data that I'm presenting from 2019 till October 2022. So this also includes the lull period during the lockdown. Despite that, you are talking of a 13.3% EVA bill collection growth. Energy consumption at 5.1%, fantastic. And you know, even if you were to go back in time before 2019, when there was a relative slowdown in the Indian economy, these numbers were not as attractive. So this is the real data which gives us conviction that why things are moving ahead. Composite PMI, so services and manufacturing both doing well, growing well. Uh, passenger vehicle sales. One interesting aspect I'll talk about is the two-wheeler degrowth. So you all will be having a question that when the entire automotive sector was growing, why did the easier sector, which is the two-wheeler, didn't grow? 
this goes to show that thanks to our savings and the buying power of Indian consumers, for the first time in at least my history of tracking this data, we saw people's preference over four-wheeler as compared to two-wheeler. An entry point of a two-wheeler is around 50,000 rupees or 60,000 rupees and an entry segment in a uh, passenger vehicle car is almost 5 lakh rupees. You see there has been more preference and there has been more growth in passenger vehicles as compared to two-wheeler. Another reason I can attribute to and this is also giving you some data points of the where the auto sector is headed. Another attribute I can tell you is about the fact that no doubt the rural growth was not very strong. Generally we have experienced that in India or in the world whenever there is inflationary high inflationary trend the urban tends to outperform the rural. So we are expecting the rural also to bounce back and two wheeler sales number also start looking up. But this is a very interesting point. You see the personal credit growth <coughs> despite the covid lull you are talking of 15.7% last three year compounded. Industrial credit it was very slow now again looking up at 6%. Rail freight, this is also a very important data point, goes to show the movement of your goods. You know a lot of people say that apna GDP taka jaisa growth lagta hi nahi hai. But this is the indicator which goes to show that your goods are moving and at what pace. So 16.7% fantastic growth. The best part about you know the Indian sectors and the Indian companies is the deleveraging of balance sheet. You know what has happened is because of lack of any new capex over the last many years our balance sheets have deleveraged, a lot of debt was cut, right. As a result of which if you see the deleveraging cycle has played out so well and it is very important to see here, this is the last time when deleveraging took place between 2002 to 2004. At that juncture also the balance sheets were so strong and the capacity utilization of the industries had gone up, a lot of bank credit offtake took place and you saw the boom and we are sitting at exactly a very similar point. The banks are looking good, I will also talk about the banking sector, but the company's capacity utilization have also gone up. So this is going to be very important inflection point for the next 8 years for all of us to make a lot of money. So you see there was great improved performance. Just one fact about the banking sector that I will talk to is, talk about is 60% reduction in the non-performing assets, which is fantastic. See. When a bank is having a very high NPA rate, it's not possible for them to disburse new loans, even to the best credit worthy corporates, right, and individuals. So now what we are seeing is everything has been cleaned up, the provisioning coverage ratio has gone up, and more importantly, they are sitting on reasonably good cash cushion, that uh, the TA1 capital adequacy ratios are very good. So now we are experiencing that overall in the banking sector, there is a very good growth of credit disbursements to the tune of 12 to 14%. And this is extremely important. Previously when we were discussing about the GDP and the growth, I think a country's growth cannot be justified unless and until there is a credit boom. And now is the point where it seems that you know definitely the entire banking sector is going to do extremely well over the course of time. And when we talk of banking sector, it is very important to include the other proxies of this sector. So they generally call it as BFSI, banking, financial and insurance sector, right. So in that also, if you see the way there has been financialization of savings, thanks to the digitization, thanks to COVID, post COVID you see a lot of financialization of savings. That has led to a lot of offsprings in terms of new emerging companies and new sectors within the financial services which have a long way. Just to cite an example, when we talk of mutual fund industry or the asset management companies, you know if I look at the entire AUM, forget the AUM, if I look at India's GDP, we are at around 3.2 trillion dollars, right? Can you guess one of a relatively, not the biggest, but one of the relatively mid players in the US based AMC companies, their AUM, which is asset under management is 4.5 trillion. So US GDP is at 22 trillion and one of the asset management companies is managing a portfolio of 4.5 trillion. So long way to go for such industries to do so well and low, most of the names you are already aware of, you know, they are the usual suspects there which are going to grow. So that is also an industry which we feel not only over the next 8 years, but over the next 15 years, it's going to grow at a compounded rate of anywhere between 12 to 15 percent. And I need not tell you, you are all smart audience, that when any company's corporate earnings tend to grow at 12 to 15 percent, what is the approximate rate at which, you know, your money can multiply. 
possible, but at least 12 to 13 percent. If I assume that your returns in the stock market are slave to your earnings or your EPS growth, at least 12 to 13 percent. Getting 12 to 13 percent over the eight years, 10 years period with power of compounding, a lot of wealth can be created, right? Also, if you talk of the insurance sector, which is related to this sector, extremely underpenetrated. If I talk of life insurance, which is the talk about your term plans and non-par plans, India's protection gap is at 88 percent. We are a highly underinsured country. And you know, we always debate about this fact that India's per capita GDP, whenever it tosses that $2,000 mark, you will see a lot of financialization of savings also taking place along with consumer boom. So we are at approximately $2,200 and by 2030, we are talking of touching almost $4,500 to $5,000. Trust me, this is the perfect recipe for a lot of insurance companies to also grow in an underpenetrated insurance market. And COVID has taught us to you know have insurance. A lot of people are started to take term plan. So COVID was a big dent for this insurance company because they had to disburse a lot of pay payouts. But now it has stabilized. And now they are focusing on growth. They are launching very innovative products. And probably this is also an industry which will be a sunrise industry for the next 8 to 10 years at least. And it's no surprise to me that if you see globally, whether in the European markets or in the US markets, when they were also in a similar stage as Indian economy, you know, the insurance sector did extremely well. And Mr. Warren Buffet, you know, and I think what compounding he has done, a lot of his compounding took place because of his investments in the insurance sector. So it's a great hint for us to, you know, have well-run insurance companies in our portfolio. So banking and uh, uh, insurance companies that I talked of, even the asset management companies I talked of, one area where I'm not very upbeat in this space is the NBFCs. So we're talking a lot of fintechs, a lot of, you know, fintech-led lending and all that. But NBFCs always will have this asset liability mismatch problem. And in a rising interest rate environment, who will have more advantage over the NBFCs is the banks who have high CASA, current account saving account ratio. The banks having high CASA will do very well because their cost of funds will be low vis-a-vis -vis the NBFCs. So we are not very upbeat on the NBFC space. Manufacturing, I think a lot of data points I'll show ahead also in terms of why manufacturing is the sector to be. And uh, the government is continuously talking about the fact that India's manufacturing as a percentage to GDP needs to go up. That's one sector which can create a lot of jobs and which will help us to reduce the dependency from the imports. <clears throat> Auto sector I talked about, you know, uh, what has happened is so we were looking at a lot of companies in the Indian automobile space. I'm not talking of the global MNCs, but even the local companies. If you compare five years ago, the average selling price of their vehicle vis-a-vis -vis the current average selling price of that vehicle, it's gone up by almost 2.7 times. Just giving an example, it's not a recommendation. Say a company like Mahindra Mahindra, if it were to launch a XUV 500 for 7 lakhs 5 years ago, we would say that it's a premium car of Mahindra and Mahindra stable. And today they are launching cars at 22 lakhs base price. And yet what we see is that they are entirely booked for the next two years. And not only that, they are building factories to increase their capacity by almost double over the next three years. It's not only really the case with M&M. You talk of Hyundai, you talk of Maruti, you talk of other MNC companies. So the customer preference and the purchasing power has gone up so much that now the base has already changed. So auto sector is a fantastic sector. Not only that, this is a sector which can be always played with proxies. By proxies, I mean the auto ancillary plays. And here you have to be very careful because we, this is an industry where a huge amount of disruption will take place over the next five years. We are having an EV revolution. A lot of y'all would be following the auto expo. Right? You're seeing the type of cars being launched. How many of the OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, are talking of ICE? Very few of them are talking of internal combustion engines. Most of them are talking of hydrogen fuel cell. So Tata uh, announced, uh, you know, in the CV segment, commercial vehicle segment, they are very upbeat on the hydrogen fuel segment. Right? So a lot of such changes are going to happen. You have to be careful in terms of identifying a particular company where this disruption does not disrupt that company. Housing sector, I mean, unprecedented growth. There was a fear that with the rising interest rate environment, the EMI is going up, there will be a slowdown. 
but the recent registration data shows that the housing sector is still very upbeat and the inventory levels are relatively low which is again a very good recipe for this sector to do further well and again this is one sector where the penetration is very low and thanks to the easy availability of credit you know you are seeing this sector booming a lot of you all would recall that a company like HDFC Limited, one of the largest private sector housing finance lender, in the newspaper, especially in Economic Times and Business Standard, they had a front page ad where they talked about disbursing almost 2 lakh crore in the housing loans. You know, there was an era 5-6 years ago when the entire book size of HDFC Limited was 2 lakh crore. And now here they are disbursing 2 lakh crore in a year. Right? You can see the change. Uh, rural recovery, this is something I am really hoping and expecting thanks to a very good monsoon and probably I will not at all be surprised if in this budget there is more emphasis to help the rural recovery. When we talk of Bharat, the very important parallel economy, it is very important that the rural sector tends to do well. Because when you hear the commentary of a lot of FMCG companies, they will talk about you know a good volume growth in the urban segment but a relatively slow down in the rural segment and that is thanks to the inflation. But now the inflationary trend going down, you will see that rural economy will tend to do well. So this is very important ingredient. Farm incomes are going to go up, that is also very helpful for the rural economy growth. Telecom sector, I think we saw massive consolidation in this sector, a few incumbents there, very few choices no doubt. Not our favorite sector to be honest because this sector always will have a lot of you know lack of free cash flow generation. But yes, there is a leader and they are doing extremely well and I was just di discussing with uh, Jwalant Bhai that whatever little bit of MS in telecommunications I have learned, you know there is this one player which has set up a fantastic new technology platform started with a 4G technology which now to scale to 5G will be relatively easy as compared to their peers. So they have front loaded a lot of capex and now going on to 4G uh, from 5, uh, 5G from 4G it will not take a huge capex for them and that will create very high ROCEs for them. So I think there are such select plays. Consolidation I think a lot of consolidation has happened uh, because of COVID a lot of smaller unorganized companies are out and uh, I was reading a lot about pent up demand. But a lot of volume growth in some of the organized companies also took place because in COVID, a lot of these unorganized players are totally out of business. So a lot of that market share was also taken by the organized players. And again, thanks to GST that has expedited. Indian balance sheets I talked about is fantastic. Again, I think most talked about topic, the domestic flows, SIPs. Let me ask in this way, how many of you all out here are not doing SIP? There is no shame, but please raise your hands. So I am so happy to see there are still a lot of people because if nobody had raised their hands, I would have been worried that is this getting saturated now. So see, I, and the reasons could be endless. You know, some of you all would be just going to come out of college, you will be starting your first job, but the awareness is there, right? 13,500 crore worth of SIP money flowing. This has also helped our markets to stabilize. And Every time I talk about you know these FIs getting a very good exit, you know let them sell. For the first time ever, they got a fantastic exit without any impact cost. What do I mean by impact cost? If there was nobody else to buy what they are selling, they had to sell their stock every 5% five, five fall. And they would not have a good experience. And then they would be wary about coming back to the Indian markets. We have given them a royal exit. So royally they will come back to purchase when we all Indians have already invested in the Indian market. So again, not only SIP, talking of EPFO, ESIC, you must be hearing in the headlines that the government is mandating a lot of public sector institutes to increase their percentage into the Indian equity. Fantastic domestic flows. So I, I remember like uh, Mr. Nilesh Shah from Kotak AMC, you know, he, if you see his tweets also, he is so patriotic that you know he gets very annoyed when people talk about the fact that you know FIs are selling and you know gore paise nikal rahe. So now he can very proudly say and we all can proudly say that it's okay let them sell. They are balancing the market you know they are giving marketability to our market and there is a power for us to buy. But again please 
don't take this for granted because during covid we had seen that our markets had fallen by 44% despite the fact all these sip all this di money was there so it's not necessary or a necessary in a sufficient condition that just because there is a di buying power our markets will never fall you know but again it's a good thing to highlight that whenever the markets fall because of any other rhyme or reason you know that there is this liquidity money power which is again going to come back to the market when the valuations become cheap so you have this conviction that the markets will rebound so now talking about sectors i think this is what probably most of you all are wanting to know unfortunately due to compliances we are not going to talk about any stocks so any companies discussed here is again not a recommendation is just to highlight the quantum of investment taking place and you know a lot of you all are very smart enough to know a lot of common sectors so i've tried my best to kind of talk about the new sunrise sectors so one of this sector which is the new energy business sector and a prime minister very wisely has announced you know a green hydrogen mission during the independence day and very recently you are hearing a lot about new announcements as to where government is helping and i believe i think the stage is set for a fantastic public private partnership to have india's dominance in this sector so if you see uh, there's a huge push in terms of you know a part to net zero carbon emission it's going to take till 2070 but at least the vision is there for the first time we are hearing that india is wanting to take lead in a new rising sector and already a lot of ingredients are in place to ensure that we can do well in this sector and it's in our best interest because we are net importers of hydrocarbons you know so it makes very good sense that if we can change the energy landscape with some domestic technology i think things can be fantastic for our country so if you see there's this you know five ingredients where the government has given target so they talk of non fossil capacity to reach 500 gigawatts by 2030 does anybody know what was the target in non fossil related energy generation till 2022 it was around 150 gigawatts and india has already achieved 122 which is fantastic generally whenever government gives targets you know we all know that you know when the time comes you know hardly 50% of it was also not achieved but i think thanks to a lot of private companies focusing on this and lot of government incentives also has driven this sector and now we are talking of touching almost 500 gigawatts so have 50% of power capacity from non fossil by 2030 uh, reduce carbon emission by almost 1 billion tons by 2030 reduce carbon intensity as a percentage of gdp to 45% uh, from 45% to lot lower levels by 2030 and again as i talked about achieving the net carbon neutrality see uh, this is extremely important every now and then you are hearing about you know what the environment hazards are even a country like china which has polluted not only itself but even the world with its factories now is worried about decarbonization you are hearing a lot of terms they are relocating their factories they are talking of effluent treatment plants so i think this is a huge opportunity for even india where thanks to the impetus with the government you know this is a sector where i believe in the next 8 to 10 years india can not only take lead but a lot of wealth also will be created for investors so if you see what is the green hydrogen policy and just to summarize uh, there is gray hydrogen there is blue hydrogen but green hydrogen is where hydrogen and the water molecules are broken up using electrolyzers using non fossil related energy so whether it could be solar powered energy whether it could be windmill related energy so it's a very green form of producing hydrogen which can act as a fuel and for lot of your refineries lot of your cars automobiles etc so there is a stock of annual production of 5 million metric tons of green hydrogen by 2030 60 to 100 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity 125 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy capacity and uh, almost there is a talk of saving 1 lakh crore with this technology and this energy source replacing a lot of imports that we are doing a lot of job creation a lot of investments and already the production link incentive scheme has already started doling out a lot of incentives for companies putting up capex in this sector so if you see what is india importing a lot of crude oil almost worth us dollar 112 billion natural gas L L lng coal we are importing despite the fact that we have one of the world's largest coal reserves it's a sorry state that we are still importing coal petroleum products we are importing ammonia we are importing so all of this can get reduced 
if we are producing our own energy source. So if you see the targets, you know, by 2030, the 500 gigawatt, you know, so if in that target, a lot will happen in this renewable energy sector and already a lot of com companies have committed a lot of capex towards ensuring that this sector goes well. So again, some data points, India is importing 33% of its coal requirements. Imagine coal, which is not to be imported or not to be produced here, can reduce so much of, you know, environmental hazards, which could be substituted by a very environmental friendly green hydrogen. Natural gas also we are importing. So now talking about some of the corporates which have announced very big ticket announcements in their annual general meeting. So one of the India's largest private sector corporates, you know, they announced an investment plan of $10 billion over the next four years for setting up four giga factories at Jamnagar for ensuring that India's energy security takes place. So first factory is regarding the solar photovoltaic giga factory. And you know, always when we talk of renewable energy sources, the problem is that China comes into picture. We are at the mercy of China for importing PV cells at all the technology that we talk of. And trust me, even the targets that we achieved, 122 gigawatts of renewable energy sources, a lot of it has happened at the mercy of China. So this is now going to change with a lot of Indian corporates committing a lot of capital for manufacturing of these goods. And that's why manufacture is now one of our favorite sectors for a long term. So first factory is regarding the integrated solar photovoltaic giga factory. Second one is energy storage giga factory. Third one is electrolyzer giga factory. Right now the biggest inhibiting factor for producing green hydrogen is electrolyzer cost. That's extremely expensive. So we know that there are a lot of Indian corporates which have scale and they've done revolution in a lot of sectors like telecom, where India in terms of data penetration has become the best in the world at one of the lowest cost in the world. And yet those companies are profitable. So if something similar can happen in this segment, a lot of money is to be made. They are even talking of fuel cell giga factory resonates with the fact that in the auto show also Tata's are committing a lot of money for fuel cell run CV buses. But you need the fuel. So this is the company which is looking at developing that. This entire capital allocation is to the tune of almost 80,000 crore over the next four years. Not only that, additional 15,000 crores over and above that is put to ensure that a lot of R&D goes into place. Again, a very famous Ahmedabad based group. They have also committed a lot to renewable energy sources of energy. And they are also talking of green hydrogen. And some of the data points, if you see what sort of replacement can take place in the refinery segment, in the ammonia segment, in the city gas distribution segment, fertilizer segment, uh, mobility segment, you know, trust me, this is something where investors should not miss an opportunity because we are trying to take a lead in this sector. They have this Mundra SEZ, which is one of the largest integrated green hydrogen hub in the world. Now, when we are talking of companies and all of this is public data, it's available on NSE's website, going to the company's, uh, you know, corporate data information. They have these presentations uploaded. Highly recommend if you want to go deep into this sector, more than this, their presentations will give you a lot of insights. So if you see the type of capacities that they're creating and already the ecosystem that they already built, you know, it's very easy for them to scale up. And you know, the best part about supplying green hydrogen and this new energy, it's not only impacting one or two industries. You talk of steel, so this company has committed a new green energy based steel plant with POSCO, one of the largest steel makers in the world, to come up over the next three to five years. Fuel cell mobility, you know, it's, it's going to be fantastic to see that India's dependency on, you know, global hydrocarbons going down with this succeeding. I know easier said than done, lot will take lot of government involvement will be involved, lot of you know ease of capital will be involved, ease of doing business will be involved. But I am very confident the way corporates are talking of in this segment, you know, who thought that in our houses, in our bungalows, we'll be putting, you know, uh, the solar panels. It has been a revolution, right? A lot of our power costs have come down because of that, you know. So same way here also I feel there could be a revolution. Even other companies, one of the largest infrastructure capital goods company in the country, is talking about 
signing MOUs with a lot of global companies for putting up electrolyzer plants. And trust me, a lot of groundwork has already started. It's not that because it's going to come by 2026 or 2028. A lot of work has already started. Surprisingly, it's not only the private companies, but even a lot of public sector enterprises have been mandated and have been targeted with the fact that they have to build the green hydrogen plants with the existing infrastructure setup. So I think uh, this is something where you know a lot of companies are going to participate, a lot of companies are going to invest into, and this is again a sector where probably a lot of wealth will be created for investors. When I talked about you know this new energy segment, not everything is going to be possible without manufacturing. So I think one key word for India's economic growth over the next 5-10 years is going to be manufacturing impetus. Gone are the days where we can be completely dependent on foreign imports. And you know, even not only India, but in fact India has this huge pressure for not only supplying domestically, but even supplying to the world. Because now the world, we are talking of Europe plus one, we are talking of China plus one, the world is now looking at alternate factories for manufacturing. And India has this advantage where even if you were to read a uh, Indian company, like one of the MNC companies annual report globally also, which is ABB and Siemens, they are talking of lot of Indian manufacturing is investing in automation. So our manufacturing now will not only be old school or old age, it's going to be with new tech. This is going to change, you know, the efficiency and the productivity of our manage, uh, manufacturing. So there was a survey done in Business Standard where top 35 CEOs were polled. And you know, all of them were asked that what is your outlook for your current capacities and capex, almost 95% of this percent of them said that we are looking at capital expansion, capital allocation and capex, which is I think a very important indicator that the sentiment has changed. It's all about the sentiment. It starts with sentiment and then you see the entire country moving. Again, a lot of groups, big groups like Tata's, Adani's, Reliance of the world, they are allocating huge capital, not only in select business, but all the business verticals. So when we talk of manufacturing and why I have selected manufacturing as a sunrise sector, it's very difficult to differentiate that in manufacturing what all are the ingredients. So generally the key ingredients in the manufacturing sector which is even highlighted in the core data which is presented by the government, you talk of capital goods, you know when we are talking of companies expanding their factories, that is not possible without the capital goods and the companies which are supplying motors, process equipments, air control equipments, lot of such things. A lot of cement is required. When the companies are talking about, when all these new energy businesses are talking about building giga factories, mega factories, can those factories be built without steel and cement? It's not possible. So a lot of that consumption will take place. A lot of engineering. India has a lot of companies where the engineering skills are at par with the best in the world. Whether you talk of in the forging space, whether you talk of in the auto ancillary space, and there's a reason why a lot of global companies are now looking at India to scale up its manufacturing and improve uh, the productivity so that they have an additional supply chain. I am not talking of the fact that overall in the next 8-10 years India will entirely replace China as a manufacturing hub. It will still take a long time because China is a lot lot ahead of us. right? But even if India were to take you know global share of anywhere which is currently less than 1%, anywhere to the tune of 3-5%, to imagine the amount of wealth that can be created from this sector. Auto, auto, ancillary space, uh, chemical sector, again, huge uh, impetus there, energy already talked about. So if you see, the best thing is that we were solely at the mercy of government capex. And now you're hearing a lot of private companies talking of capex. And I'll show you some data which companies are talking of which capex. And again, that's not a recommendation, it's just an indicative as to where the capital allocation is headed. <coughs> a very ballpark estimate as to till 2024, and we are talking about till 2030, the approximate growth in the capital allocation amount of the private companies is to the tune of 16.4%. So already on a high base, when the growth is at 16%, there's no way that your GDP can slow down when so much of capital allocation is taking place. So again, if you see the sectoral split of a lot of listed private sector companies, whether it is conglomerates, metals, power utilities, telecom, cement and building material, autos, energy, IT, 
I think everywhere in IT when I talk of capex, lot of you all will be asking that why does TCS need to do capex? It's not TCS, but it's the data centers that are being put up. It requires huge power. It requires huge capex. And now India is hosting a lot of global companies' data centers. I think this is a game-changing phenomena. A lot of companies are participating in this trend also. This is also part of infrastructure, though it is digital infrastructure. Thanks to the impetus given by the government. See, the government does realize that India's manufacturing only on its own is not capable to take on the world because there are a lot of other countries which incentivize the manufacturing. They incentivize via, you know, interest rate subvention. They incentivize via, you know, production link scheme. In incentivize via better tax breaks for exports, which was not the case with India since last many years. Thanks to the awareness and thanks to the fact that government has become very proactive. And even the PLI scheme, the production link incentive scheme, I think that has picked up like anything. And every month you start hearing that new and new sectors are added. And government is doing a very smart thing. They are adding not the basic commoditized sectors. You will not hear a PLI scheme in a basic steel company. But when it is talk of specialty steel, you are getting an incentive. Why? Because for basic, you know, everybody can make it. But specialty is something that we are already importing. And if we can import substitute that, it's a win-win for everyone. So whether we talk of semiconductors, it will be a long way. But still, already we are hearing of a lot of companies allocating a lot of capital in this sector. There could be a lot of Future companies also coming into the stock markets, which could be having the foray in semiconductors, uh, high efficiency solar PV modules, uh, battery storage, automobiles, specialty steel, textile products. Uh, still, even in basic sectors, India is importing a lot of stuff. Like in the pharmaceutical sector, India is importing a lot of APIs, uh, the initial intermediates. A lot of that is now changing. A lot of these chemical companies are talking about huge capex, and especially in the segments where there's import substitute. And the best thing is that when those capacities come on stream, you see the government protecting a lot of those companies by anti-dumping duties, which is helping them to justify their capex. If I talk of metals as a sector, right, one will be surprised that a company like say Tata Steel, again it's not a recommendation but just an indicative, has given plans of increasing its steel capacity from current 20 million tons to touch 40 million tons by 2030. The capacity that it took Tata Group to build over the last 100 plus years, the same capacity is going to come over the next 6 to 8 years. And when Tata Group or any such group in the steel or the metal sector talks about increasing their capacity, whether by a greenfield, brownfield, imagine how many other industries benefit. As I mentioned, it will take a lot of cement, it will again take a lot of steel to build those factories, those blast furnaces. It will take a lot of capital goods companies, the refractory companies supplying a lot of ingredients to build these factories, right? And to run these factories. It will take a lot of mining companies. It will take a lot of mining equipment companies to supply equipments for Tata Steel to mine its uh, backward integrated cooking coal or iron ore, right? So, so many proxy industries benefit when such huge capital allocation takes place. And just to give you a ballpark figure, 1 million ton of steel capacity takes around a billion dollars which is around almost 8,000 crores. Now you can do the math that only one company allocating and forget one company, India's current steel capacity sits at around 120 million tons. We are talking by 2030, the government is given a target of 300 million tons. Let me be more humble and say that even if you were to touch say 220 or 250 million tons, you can do the math, 120 to 150 additional steel capacity is going to come which takes $1 billion. So the amount of capital allocation, the amount of jobs created, the amount of orders given to the capital good companies is unprecedented. And this is not something surprising because over the last 7-8 years, because of the lack of capacity utilization and lack of demand, a lot of these industries didn't put capacity. And now their existing capacities are come to an optimum stage. So last 10 years, the things have not been done. Over the next 10 years, you will see a lot of new things happening and new capex is being committed. So it's averaging, you know, re re reverting back to the mean. Even in the power sector, we know that this was a booming sector and thanks to one famous group's IPO. And I was so surprised back then, it was a hugely oversubscribed IPO and very few people knew that, you know, its power plants have also not started. So they're not even making money 
and there's so much of frenzy that power is an eternal sector and India's power demand is so much that this will ever, it will be an evergreen sector. And then what we saw was, this was a sector where hardly any new thermal power capacities came up over the last seven, eight years. And there were so many bank related NPAs which were related only to this sector. But a lot of consolidation has taken place. I showed you the statistics that the power demand is again started to rise. The plant load factor, the plant availability factors are going up. So now what's going to happen is that all these companies are committed to new capex. But the good news is that the existing incumbent stronger players are committing new capital towards more efficient and towards more new generation power capacities, which is basically the renewable sources of energy. So again, highlighting the Tata group, a lot of their companies give investor presentation. I highly recommend checking them out. By 2030, they are talking about their power portfolio touching almost 35 to 40 percent through RE sources vis-a-vis -vis the current thermal power sources. So the new money is getting involved not in the old power generation segment but into the new renewable energy segment. So again a lot of opportunities there to make money. And very simple stats, when all these companies are putting capex, who benefits? The companies which are going to supply the equipment. The companies especially in the capital goods segment. So a lot of them are listed in the stock market and can be invested into. Cement and building material. So again one of my favorite sector. Uh, here if you see the capacities are going to get expanded hugely. And there is this group which recently purchased Ambuja and ACC from Holcim. And over the next five years they are talking of doubling their capacity. Even Ultratech group has talked about you know increasing the capacity by almost 40% over the next four years. And it's not going to stop there. India's consumption in the cement segment is going to go up. The best thing about this sector is that you cannot import cement. You cannot import grinded cement. You might import clinker. It's very difficult to import the grinded cement. So here I think a lot of companies are extremely well placed. The balance sheets are extremely strong. And they have already front loaded a lot of capex which will help them to increase their capacity. So again, as a sector, it's going to double its capacity over the next 8-10 years. A lot of other proxy plays are going to benefit. Chemicals, I think again a sector where India's global penetration in this sector is only 2.5% in terms of global share of our exports. China is at 25%. Just imagine the way our companies are placed in terms of their capex. A lot of these companies, if you read their conference call commentaries, they are talking about a lot of global companies driving their new capital allocation. They are giving them long term contracts, 10 year contracts, 15 year contracts. So it's not that these companies are doing capex on their own. They are doing a lot of capex through these long term contracts where they get initial mobilization advances. So very efficient way of allocating capital. A lot of the companies are doing a fantastic job and a lot of select companies are also not only doing the commodity chemicals increasing in terms of capacity but a lot of specialty chemical which are import substitute which requires a lot of R&D and this is where I feel a lot of value and wealth can be created for investors. So separating the men from the boys, I think this is the sector which is very important to understand what is true speciality and what is commodity. This is one of my favorite charts I think uh, just to give you an indication of all these sectors that we talked of where wealth can be created and if you see a 10 year track record of the index returns you know last th initial three uh, decades they have been fantastic returns the last decade was very tepid 8.8 percent compounded this decade has started with almost 12.8 percent compounded i think no guesses for prediction but you all are wise enough to know that this is the decade where fantastic rebound will take place and the last two decades including this decade, the mean reversion takes place, helps us to generate very high returns. Very important chart. When I talk of different sectors and them allocating capital, it's very important to know how credit worthy are a lot of these corporates. And until recently the data says that for every five companies being upgraded, and it's very important to know because when they are upgraded, their cost of capital is low only one company was downgraded. So the credit worthiness of Indian corporates going up is a huge say for the banking sector to lend at reasonable rates. And this is because of inflation but going ahead I am very confident that overall cost of capital is going to come down. You know currently you will be surprised that Indian mortgage rates are at 8.5 percent thanks to the fact that recently it's increased. In US it's not very less it's four and a half percent. 
So India in terms of its efficiency of reduction in cost of capital thanks to the stability from the macros and inflationary trends, I think our cost of capital over the period of time will go down which is again a very secret recipe for our corporates to allocate capital in a very efficient way. Again as I always mention that your stock market returns are linked with your nominal GDP growth and the company's earnings and when the companies are so efficiently allocating so much of capital, I, I think it's, it's very difficult to doubt that over the next 5-10 years, why shouldn't Indian corporates and especially the selected sectors that we have talked of should not grow their earnings by a compounded rate of anywhere between 14 to 16 percent. I think it's easily written. Again in exports, by 2020 the target is to touch 1 trillion, we are at 400 billion. Even if we don't touch 1 trillion and we touch say 800 billion, I think that is huge, huge impetus for a lot of these companies to do extremely well. So I will conclude by informing about, you know, a lot of people have this question and feedback and what are the different ways in which we as retail investors can participate. So I think uh, the best way to invest in equity is by not trying to time it and systematically investing in equities is one of the best ways. There are a lot of tools now available, a lot of companies that you are aware of, of you would be researching. I think you have to be very careful of not buying at any prices. Buying at any prices does not work. Valuation, checking the valuations is also very important. So be very careful, don't get carried away by the frenzy of a lot of sectors. I know a lot of you all are aware of the fact that a lot of new generation companies had IPO'd last year and today they have destroyed shareholders wealth by 50 to 70 percent. So don't get carried away, valuation is also very important, real cash generation is very important. A best way to generate an income plan for the people looking at income post retirement is systematic withdrawal. Whether you do it in direct equity, whether you do it via mutual fund, whether you do it in your debt fund allocation, I think it's worked very well and this is what I think we suggest to a lot of our clients. Best way for small savers, maybe somebody just out of college starting a job, start allocation in an SIP even in a small way. Only for those who can research, who has time to attend AGMs, read conference calls, my humble suggestion is only those people should go into direct equity investment. Otherwise, allocating, building a diversified portfolio is a very difficult job. I am learning it till date. Debt funds have become attractive. Don't avoid that. I know there's an equity cult going on in your country, but right allocation in your portfolio is very important. So debt has become very attractive and very tax efficient too. Again, I think from, a, from one of my personal experiences, a very humble advice that I give to everyone, please review your health insurance. Because a lot of your equity savings and your future wealth creation can go haywire if your healthcare costs are not taken care of with a health insurance. A lot of us have old legacy health insurance which needs to get upgraded. So I end my talk here. Happy investing to you all. And again the disclaimer, but uh, I'm open for any questions and I really appreciate your patient listening. Thank you. Before we start the questions, one request, there is a uh, feedback form on each for everyone's chair. Request all of you to please fill it up before you go and you can leave it here on the table. Uh, you can go ahead with the question. If you can please stand up and just share your name and the question. My name is Gagan. Previous, in previous session you told that you are happy that FII is selling. Currently, if we compare the data uh, from Jan 2020 to Jan 2023, FII's net sale is nearly 3 lakh crore, which is 31 billion dollars. And the net buy of there is still around 2, uh, two lakh 84,000 crores, which is nearly 34 billion dollars. So, post-COVID, how you see the activities of FII and DII? And many are predicting that the GDP of India will, it can be nearly about, uh, okay, let's not go to GDP. The economy of India, it can touch 30 trillion dollars by 2045. How you see the Indian stock markets by 2045? Yeah. Uh, so very humbly I would say, I don't know about 2045 because I think most of us are more interested in knowing what will happen over the next 5-10 years. Because say I am 38, I will probably think of retiring at 52, 55, right? Maybe earlier, 
if my equity wealth creation takes place the way I've talked about, right? So, you know, there are these targets of 30 trillion dollar GDP and all that. We don't know whether, you know, what's it's in store for so long. So my suggestion is focus over the next five, 10 years, huge opportunity for us. Talking about the FI selling, if you see historically, the FI hold anywhere as low as 14% in the Indian free float to as high as 22%. Currently, after what have they sold, you know, they are sitting at somewhere around 18 to 19%, right? I know for sure they're not going to zero down. And I'm happy they're selling because they also are answerable to the investors. And you know, you should know the reason why they're selling. Out of all the different markets that they've invested, especially the emerging markets, India's performance over last 10 years, not only the last decade, despite you know the data that I showed that last decade was not so great for we the investors because we expect no less than double digit. But for them an 8.5% is fantastic as compared to the other places where they parked their capital. India is one country where they made money last decade, last to last decade and even decade previously. So when they are managing a emerging market portfolio and you know when they are answerable to the investors, and when they're taken a very big hit from China, what happens is if you, you need to remove money from your portfolio and there's one uh, portfolio which is not done well and the other portfolio is done well, what will you do? Will you be able to remove only money from the portfolio which is not done well? You'll have to even balance it out by removing the money from portfolio which is done well, right? So in that case, they, they were forced to sell and also because a lot of global factors and India's weight changing. But trust me, they are giving you and us the best opportunity to buy. Imagine a scenario what will happen if all this SIP money also comes, all this FI money also comes. India is already an expensive market and eventually valuation prevails you know over everything. So will we the investors get a chance to buy our own equity at such a reasonable rate? So I am very happy they are selling. I doubt if they will go anywhere lower than 14% of holding of the free float. But imagine what happens when you are invested and not tracking these micro data so much. Once you are invested, eventually they will have to come back to India because India's GDP has touched 3.2 trillion, it will touch 5 trillion, it will touch 6 trillion. So our weight will go up, already recently our weight has gone up from 8% to almost 12%. Tomorrow it will go to 18%. Forcefully they will have to again get that capital back to our country. Once you are already invested and then they bring the capital, what happens to your returns? So enjoy the movement. Don't think Thank so much micro. Thank you. Sector allocation, can you guide some? Uh, fantastic question, sir. Very important. See, when I talk of some select sectors, it doesn't mean that the other sectors won't do well, right? And India is such a beautiful opportunity where there's under penetration in so many sectors that even if there is normalization of demand, you know, all these sectors will participate. So generally, if you see any well-constructed portfolio, especially say a mutual fund portfolio or a PMS portfolio, you know, generally all these sunrise sectors they are in terms of allocation anywhere between 25 to 30 percent and a lot of these companies that are talked of are not only new companies which have started all of afresh they're already old companies which are now committing more aggressively the capital into the newer technologies yeah. so i feel that you know manufacturing is a sector when we are talking of manufacturing touching more than 15 percent of our gdp then i think manufacturing as an entire sector that i talk of and a lot of ambit of companies that i talked of should be at least anywhere between 25 to say 40 percent of your portfolio yeah. yes would you like to uh, tell us something about the defense sector because today lot is talked about the defense sector yes. and uh, could you also tell us the methodology to identify the good companies in the defense sector? It's a great question. See, in the defense sector, and why I was a little wary to point that sector out, because it's a definitely a sunrise sector, no two ways about it. Uh, unfortunately, in Indian stock markets, the majority and plethora of the companies in the defense sector are from the public sector space. They are very efficient companies. Uh, their execution track record has been stupendous. But my only slight concern is they have to serve the nation. So if you recollect, there was this one company doing extremely well, doling out margins of almost 24%. And the government all of a sudden changed their policy stance and announced that there will be a margin capping in those companies. And the market was spooked and you know the company retracted. So yes, that is one fear that we have. 
uh, government is not here for the stock market. They are here for the country's safety. And this country's safety is happening with our money, our taxpayers' money. So there is always this overhang. But nonetheless, there will be beautiful opportunities in this sector coming from a lot of private companies. Because the private companies, when they do business, they will not be at the mercy of government dictating all the policies. And very few companies have IPO recently. Not only that, over a period of time, the existing groups are also changing their business model to have defense as a very big say in their overall portfolio. Like say, if I have to just citing an example, not a recommendation, LNT has a huge defense portfolio. But as compared to the infra portfolio, it's still so minuscule. But over the longer horizon, if defense is going to be a prominent sector, I'm sure LNT is a company that's going to leave this sector, right? So they're going to grow. So their pie will increase. So a lot of companies that are in the listed space, but just be a little careful of the risk aspect that I talked of. So again, export in defense is a fantastic opportunity. That is where the government will never intervene. Because the government will allow these companies to recoup the type of margins that they were not able to earn domestically by compensating in the foreign. So that is why I feel that in this sector, the PSUs have already done very well. They were like trading at very abysmally low levels. And they have done extremely well. So now you have to be a little careful of the valuations. But this is a sector where from the private space, I think there will be a lot of new opportunities taking place. But yeah, a sector which an investor should not neglect and <coughs> is a part of the manufacturing theme that I talked of. Sir, one more question. Since a lot of big groups are coming into green er energy as you explained here, uh, and also some of the steps being taken by WTO, do you think that carbon trading is going to be a big business in the coming years? Because some of the companies in last one or two years are doing extremely well in carbon trading yes so yeah it's it's going to be a huge segment and if you uh, see recently some of the already listed power exchanges in the country yes. have already announced a huge foray into carbon trading yes. right so i think when we talk of the world focusing on decarbonization and the energy mix of the world is going to change for the good i think this is also another segment because a lot of legacy companies will not have option but to buy you know these carbon credits so when we are talking of energy as a sector yes carbon trading should also be included into it i suppose it will eventually be the yeah. way power became a prominent sector and power trading was inculcated today you know there are these yeah. power exchanges listed in the stock markets the way you have the normal stock markets i think i'm sure this will also evolve over a period of time and there are already companies who have talked about four in this Got it. So when we talk of telecom infra, we are talking of telecom gears, which are like switches, routers, uh, fiber optics, right? Now here you have to be very selective because uh, you know there's huge global competition also. They yeah. Though India is banned, but a lot of India's existing telecom backbone is at the mercy of a lot of US based and Chinese based companies. So overnight it's not going to be possible to change this entire segment. And even if today India were to change entire backhaul of their telecommunications from the foreign equipment players to the domestic equipment players, we don't have the capacity, right? A lot of components that go into making these network gears are still imported. So that is why the impetus via the PLI scheme that the government has given, though it will take time, but it will dole out huge opportunities. And some of the companies you mentioned have been taken over by bigger groups. And the bigger groups, not only themselves internally, but they have been mandated by the government also to ensure that our import dependency reduces. So I fully agree, there will be huge scope in this sector. But again, as I said, you have to be careful in some companies, like say for example, fiber optics. If you see some of the companies in this space, if you see the track record, not necessarily they have been very, uh, you know, uh, profit generating or margin creative. Despite them having global level scale, that's not a place where India needs to import. 
yet it has not worked out. So telecom gear, India still has a long, long way to go. Very few companies to play, but again you have to also be careful of the valuations. No, no, it's a very valid point. Unfortunately, I cannot talk on any uh, stock specific, company specific, but I think it's a rightly pointed out. And again, when I talk of manufacturing and the impetus that is given by the government in the PLI scheme, a lot of companies allocating capital, you know, all these are covered. But my humble request is don't just always get carried away with a frenzy, have a focus on valuation and also what sort of margins these companies are currently doing. Because it could take, when we talk of, you know, say things like uh, fabrication and chip manufacturing, very few people know, I've talked to my friends at Intel, that if India were to foray into this, what will be the break-even point for the Indian companies allocating capital in this space? It is at least five years. So, things are good, but you know, uh, it's not going to be overnight. You know, a lot of these companies that you talked of, if you see their margin track record, that's been quite haywire. So, uh, I'm very upbeat, but yes, now with big groups foraying into this segment, you have more conviction to hold them for longer. Yes. So you answered your own question <laughs> and his question too. Thank you, thank you. But uh, yeah, see, uh, there is this talk of ESG. A lot of you all would be aware of what is ESG, Environmental Social Governance, right? So a lot of, you know, in India we talk about a lot of promoters in the way that, you know, typically there is a saying, chor bane more. I am happy to see due to a lot of reforms that have taken place, now stealing in India is not going to be easy. And thanks to the fact that we have one of the world's best regulators. The way SEBI has been protecting retail investors and they are not only talking of retail investors, they are even eyeing a lot of companies which are into thinking of doing a lot of frauds. Nowadays, the new generation promoters, the next generation promoters are talking about here, yes, sab, so, so crore cash uthana chodo, cash park karna difficult hai. Let us create market caps. They are getting market cap hungry. Who benefits out of that? Not only them, even us. So yeah, but still, you know, there will be these uh, bad companies. So it, it's very known. If, if a retail investor like you knows which groups are tinted, tainted, you know, it's very easy to understand. And there is always mutual fund, ETF, a lot of ways where you can invest and take participate you know, in all these sectors in a well, you know, well actively managed fund manner, you know, that way. Yeah. Okay, we, uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, yours one and then your last, okay, last two questions. So, uh, in AI, you know, one of the best place, especially when you talk of investment, no doubt I think it's disruptive. We were just talking about, you know, chat GDP and all these things. So I think the best way to play is through uh, Indian IT companies. And I strongly recommend you to read the transcripts and the conference call commentary of TCS. They mentioned about automation and use of AI in lot of their IT services business. Because, you know, they have to see if by doing that, because the IT, traditional IT services business, the margins are shrinking, right? It's cloud and these other businesses which are helping them, the digital business which are helping them better margins. So can they substitute a human brain or hiring new people vis-a-vis -vis that automation and AI based software coding, which can help them to reduce the cost in the commoditized IT services space. So I think a good way uh, to play will be a lot of Indian IT companies. Sir, I don't know about 2023, but till 2030, India as a market is, you know, stock pickers market. And I think active investment will generate higher returns is what I firmly believe. But, uh, you know, a lot of people who are very off and who cannot do a lot of active investment are better off putting their money in passive investment. So I firmly believe it's not like one size fits all. It totally depends upon your profile as an investor based on which you should asset allocate and select what you want to do. Uh, 
So again, pointing out to your question regarding passive or active, the same sector which did three times, you know, returns. I'll show you a lot of companies in the mid cap, small cap and large cap IT space, which gave five to seven times return. So again, answers your question that. Are you talking only the index? Yes. IT, uh, IT index. IT index, okay. So again, uh, as you said that it had a fantastic run from COVID lows, then it was a favorite sector. A lot of smart investors looking at last year's returns put in a lot of IT funds, their money lot in IT funds. And 22, you know, the IT sector was down, the index was down by almost 18%. A lot of these good companies were down by 20 to 40%. I feel that the valuations have become more fair, but this is a sector which will have huge headwinds in the next one year. But again, the opportunity lies in the cloud space, AI space, right? So over a longer horizon, this sector will do well. And as I said, in a diversified equity portfolio, it's very hard to avoid a sector like IT, which has always been free cash flow generating and rewarding to the shareholders. Uh, yeah, okay. Last, sure. come on. Can you, can you come closer? Okay. Uh, the mic, you can hear? Uh, I can hear, it's okay. Uh, sorry, I'll not be able to take any stock specific uh, talks because of compliance. Uh, budget of Avnar And at TCS, ICIC, ICIC Bank, ONGC, Company no long term at a Tamarakilu invest Karuju and it gave it the Raki Mukwaju. Sab Satsuko budget Muto Nathila. Egg, 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 Thank you very much, Parthiv Bhai. Uh, we had, I think, a very enlightening uh, session, and all of you, I think, enjoyed it. And thank you all for coming and spending and giving your time here. So I uh, will close the session here. He is available. If you have any individual questions, you can approach him directly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.